Patrick Wolf is the Frederick Hovde Dean of Science and Miller Family, uh, Miller Family Professor of Computer Science and Statistics at Purdue University. Patrick got his PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2003, and he soon joined after the faculty at Harvard in 2004. In 2012, he returned to the UK, where he took up, sorry, a established career fellowship and Royal Society Research Fellowship at the University College of London. So for those of you who don't know this fellowship, they're extremely difficult to get and extremely prestigious, and in particular, they allow you to buy out from teaching for several years and focus on your research. So they're excellent fellowship to get. Um, he, what he did also while he was back in the UK, he helped set up and lead the Alan Turing Institute, which is the UK's national center for data science and artificial intelligence. After five years in the UK, he returned to the US, where last year he joined Purdue University. His research interests are in um, global mathematics, statistics, physical sciences, and most recently, he was an organizer and Simons Foundation Fellow at the Isaac Newton Institute for Mathematical Science uh, for the 2016 semester research program on theoretical foundations of statistical network analysis. So Patrick's has, his research has received a number of awards from international bodies such, that, such as the Royal Society, the Acoustical Society of America, and the IEEE. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, Patrick Wolf is an alum of this department. He graduated in the late 90s with a degree in ECE, as well as music, if I remember correctly. Okay, all of this being said, let me present you with this plaque commemorating your return <laughs> to your roots, to Illinois. Thank you very much. <laughs> and, uh, well, Patrick will tell us today about big network data, challenges and opportunities for data science. Patrick, the floor is yours. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Ali. The one thing uh, Ali did not mention was um, shortly after I joined Harvard, uh, while he was still a PhD student, uh, he and I became uh, of the first set of collaborators I had, or he was the first collaborator I had right after I joined Harvard. So we worked together for a number of years, and uh, I used to uh, tell him stories from my Midwestern upbringing and time here in Champaign-Urbana. I did not at the time know that he would soon end up here, so we often uh, share a few stories over a beer. And uh, it's great to be back. I kind of try to be around maybe once a year or so. I was able to be at the Allerton workshop last year, and I know the, uh, the next one is coming up sort of pretty soon again. So it's a huge pleasure to be here. And uh, frankly, it's nice to be only about an hour and a half away for a change. Uh, and anybody who would like uh, a chance to come and visit us at Purdue, you know, please let me know. My email is really, really easy these days. It's patrick at purdue.edu. So you can get in touch with me very, very easily. Um, I thought I would do a couple of things. Uh, on one hand, I'll sort of um, present uh, several kind of research vignettes drawn from the work that I've done with colleagues and collaborators over the past several years, which has largely been focused on kind of making sense of networks, data sets that come in the form of networks. Um, but before that, I wanted to do one other thing, which is to share a little bit with you about what I've learned sort of about data science um, from sort of being a, a researcher and research participant, but then also an organizer of sort of slightly, slightly larger things. And um, this is maybe interesting perhaps because um, when we were setting up this national institute in the UK, uh, it would almost be as if the National Science Foundation came along and said, you know, here's a hundred million dollars, go set up an institute within six months or something. So we, we had the very uh, happy problem of having to scramble to make things happen very quickly. But, um, but the first thing we did is we set out call for proposals to the community uh, in the UK and more broadly. Uh, and we kind of asked the question, you know, what is data science? What are the sort of core technical challenges? What are the areas that you think uh, will really give us progress on, on hard problems? And um, we probably had, I don't know, on the order of 40 or 50 so proposals come back. And it turns out that they clustered really naturally into the set of topics that I've listed on this slide. So there's a, if you go to the Turing Institute website, you can, you can find a longer report about this. But I thought it would be useful maybe just to take a minute and sort of chat through some of these problems. 
Um, we did this a couple of years ago, but even talking to folks on campus here throughout the day, you know, none of these technical challenges are the type that would have disappeared within the past couple of years. They're all kind of still with us. Um, I also learned uh, in my, ex my experiences to scrupulously put things in alphabetical order so that no one set of researchers is offended by where their topic appears on this list. Um, so automating and propagating uncertainty quantification, um, as we study sort of larger and larger systems, uh, for example, as, um, as atmospheric and climate scientists begin not just to do forward simulation using physics-based models, but begin to kind of use sensor data to tie back to the models. Um, the question of how you deal with uncertainty quantification in these very large models and systems becomes even more, even more crucial. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the things you might use to tackle problems like these are techniques like probabilistic programming. Um, there are a number of things to think about here, but, um, but that, that's clearly an area that's kind of ripe for progress. Um, kind of co-designing algorithms and architectures um, if you think about TI or NVIDIA or Intel, um, everybody faces the same problem. Um, in order to design the next generation of chipsets, you really need to know what the core algorithmic primitives are going to be. So for decades, it was LinPack and LayPack and dense matrix multiplication, and, and that's what everyone benchmarked their machines on. But it's not so clear, for example, if you're interested in, in you know, networks and graphs, for example, that dense matrix multiplication is the underlying you know, driving algorithmic primitive that you might want to focus your hardware design on. So there's some interesting things to think about there. Um, control and computational and statistical trade-offs. There was another recent program at the Newton Institute in Cambridge about this. Um, I would say that we know a few points on the landscape but we don't have any way to turn a knob that trades off, in general, computational efficiency with statistical efficiency. So I can make an algorithm much more computationally efficient by throwing away half the data, but I've certainly just hurt my statistical efficiency. Um, sometimes I can relax a seemingly hard, formally hard problem and come up with something that's provably optimal, but many times I can't. So I think there's a, a pretty grand challenge here to understand in a, more, in a more general framework how we control some of those types of trade-offs. Um, fusing multimodal data at scale, I mean, this sounds a little bit uh, jargony, but I was talking with our uh, new department chair this morning, and um, we were discussing how critical it's become to be able to sort of treat structured and unstructured data at scale and be able to sort of fuse them together to make inferences. So you could imagine text and speech and more traditional forms of scalar or vector valued data, you know, images and the like. Um, and that, that just becomes, you know, an ever more prevalent problem. At the same time, learning to change how we think about algorithm design to take advantage of distributed computation, I think is also going to become more important. Um, we have all kinds of different modes of computing resource available to us now fairly ubiquitous on-demand computing, but um, you know, if you've ever played around with, with Hadoop and, and, uh, and all of its various brethren, you'll know that you know, implementing all uh, but the most trivial algorithms quickly becomes, can become very, very complicated. And something that's very easy to conceptualize, like a matrix inversion or an EM algorithm, uh, can suddenly become trickier when you think about implementing it in a more distributed environment. Um, and you know, of course, there are folks out there who are who are chipping away at problems like this. Um, you know, if you were forced to do principal components or an eigenvector decomposition um, and you had to do it in a local distributed manner, what would the best option be and what could you prove about the result? Um, that would be an example. More generally, how are we ever going to solve a large-scale inverse problem like the one that comes with, you know, weather prediction and climate modeling um, if we can't sort of do it in a distributed computing environment? Um, machine learning in non-Euclidean spaces, that's another way to draw kind of mathematicians into the, into the picture in data science. Um, uh, there's been a lot of talk in recent years about thinking more generally about the geometry and topology of data. Um, I think, you know, there's, um, there's some interesting things to do there and to say, um, but mostly I think it's, again, it's a way to bring in purer parts of the community. 
uh, and, um, and kind of meet folks halfway on some important applied problems. Um, social data science, I think that's just a recognition that um, an awful lot of the data that we now collect and are interested in reasoning about is sort of from or about humans. And um, I think um, there's always a risk that if you kind of analyze these types of data blindly without any subject matter expertise, you either end up with obvious or erroneous conclusions. So there's a lot of interesting things to do at the sort of the quantification or the hardening, if you like, of the social sciences and how these are starting to blend together with, um, with folks in engineering and mathematics and statistics and so forth. Um, streaming data and anomaly detection. This comes up whether you're talking about uh, fraud detection or cyber defense or another, a number of other applied challenges. And I guess as a statistician, I see these uh, through the lens of sort of non-parametric statistics. But, um, but there are many other ways to think about capturing and modeling sort of non-stationarity in data um, and, and understanding and exploiting dynamics and change points. Um, and then lastly, and this is, happens to be the thing that I've been interested in for a while, um, you know, how do we understand especially large networks? Um, in the 50s and 60s, graph theory was uh, the abstract domain of, of probabilists and, and graph theorists. And there wasn't necessarily any reason to believe that sort of large-scale networks, be they natural or engineered, would, would sort of appear everywhere. Uh, now suddenly, whether you think about connected vehicles or Facebook or, uh, or brain imaging, you know, suddenly large networks are a very, very natural type of data set to think about. And if you ask the very natural question of, um, you know, which undergraduate statistics textbook do I pull off the shelf to tell me how to deal with these types of data? The answer is it doesn't really exist. Most of the techniques that we've developed, we meaning the broader mathematics and engineering community, you know, over the past several decades rely pretty, uh, pretty heavily on, on a Hilbert space structure, right? I mean, we all learned the orthogonality principle when you sit down to, arrive, to derive the, uh, the equations for the Kalman filter, et cetera, or whether you think about, um, you know, even least squares all the way back to Gauss, uh, it's, it's all driven by the sort of underlying vector space structure. And networks don't come with any sort of obvious embedding into such a space. I mean, physical networks, networks that exist in the physical world are a little bit different, but, um, you know, in general, there's no way to make sense of the notion of an angle between two networks. So there's a lot less to kind of get your hands into and, um, and sort of building the foundations of this area is something that I've been interested in for, for several years. Um, I tend to publish mostly in statistics these days. When I started getting interested in this area, um, we would send papers to the top journals and there would be a lot of confusion about which associate editor should handle them and we would often get pretty random reviews and comments because not many people were working in the area. These days, if you talk about the annals or the uh, RSSB or JASA, you know, any of the main statistics journals, they've all got at least a couple associate edi editors who are pretty much specialists in network analysis. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's grown a lot in popularity, I would say. Some of the positives of that are there are a lot more people contributing some of the negatives are that there's a little bit maybe of a bandwagon effect and, and people sometimes can have a tendency to kind of work on cartoon version of the problems. But I think that's kind of an inevitable, inevitable part of a, a growing community of people who are working around a given area. And those of you who have been around for the introduction of other methods like wavelets, for example, you know, would have seen similar things take place uh, as that community became bigger. Um, so, as I said, I just wanted to kind of share a few thoughts about this. Um, some of these areas may well impinge on the types of things that you're doing or thinking about doing, but I think, um, I think this is actually not a bad set of kind of core technical challenges to think about when we consider how our disciplines are going to interact with, with kind of data science and how data science is going to transform different sectors of, um, of the economy and, and of society. So I'll do now what I said I would, which is to kind of talk you through some of the work that, um, that I've done with collaborators in this area. And uh, rather than go into to a technical deep dive on anything, 
I'm going to give a series of vignettes, but please feel free to answer, uh, ask questions at the end, and I'm happy to give more details or point you to the paper or the preprint. And um, I'll try to kind of get at the gist of what's going on without getting too, uh, too wrapped up in, in sort of technical, technical jargon. Um, so uh, here's maybe the place to start, and I, I sort of said it in words before, but uh, we can do it pictorially as well. Um, I've been interested really in trying to build a, a self-consistent or coherent framework for the analysis of networks as data objects. And, um, and the big kind of gap, if you want to think about it that way, is just between the things that we know how to do for kind of classical structured data uh, signals, images, videos, et cetera, vectors essentially, things that live in vector spaces, and then what we might expect fairly to be able to do for networks. So um, if I think about sort of classical statistics, it doesn't even have to be statistics. It can be, again, least squares all the way back to, the, to, to, you know, to, to, to at least Gauss. Um, we have a notion always of, of optimality, of what an optimal algorithm is, whether or not it exists. Um, in the context of the statistical machinery of the past 130, 140 years, um, that means that we get a lot of tools sort of for free. So we have a way to talk about the analysis of variance, uh, the variability in data that's explained by a particular model versus the variability that's left unexplained. In this case, this might well be, you know, you might be using this to discover uh, the spring constant, you know, using Hooke's law, which tells you that the force force displacement curve of a, of a response curve of a spring is linear when you're driving it in the right physical regime. Um, so most of the variance is explained by the model. If it were driven in a nonlinear way, then of course you might have a parabolic response and a linear fit wouldn't explain all the variability in the data. Um, and building on that, you know, largely since the end, uh, middle and end of World War II has been decision theory and all the things that have followed in terms of communications, control, signal processing, et cetera. Um, so again, you can pick up any undergraduate or first year graduate text off the shelf and basically understand all of the sum total of, of knowledge that we have about this set of problems. Um, you ask to do anything similar in the context of networks and it gets a lot harder. So this is a, a picture or a pictorial a rendering of a matrix um, and the matrix is one way to represent a graph if you think of taking each vertex in a graph and assigning it to a row and a column of a matrix, I can then use the upper or lower triangular portion of the matrix to index the set of all possible edges in the graph. And you know, if the edges are directed, then I can use the whole matrix, otherwise I'm only entitled to half of it, um, et cetera, et cetera. So here is a, a clique that happens to be, you know, a, a clique on, on on six vertices that happens to be embedded in some sense in this, in this particular graph. And um, you know, what are the uh, properties associated with the optimal detection of such cliques, for example? Uh, more generally, you know, how do I model and fit uh, a, a, a data object such as this? Um, how do I think about evaluating goodness of fit with respect to a particular model? So I can't just sort of fit a main effect and linearly knock it out and look at a residual. I have to do something slightly more, slightly more complicated. And eventually, if you don't care about networks, but you do care about getting answers, then you just want to know, you know, how do I make optimal decisions? What are the sort of inferential questions that I can fairly ask and answer of these types of data objects? And, and what are the tools, the methodologies, the algorithms that I can sort of pull off the shelf and implement? Um, so the really fun thing about working in this area is most of these basic questions have not been answered, at least not in a very satisfactory way. So sure, there are plenty of heuristics and kind of application-driven approaches, but there isn't anything like the sound theoretical basis that you would expect to introduce as part of teaching a course, for example. Um, so um, I thought I would talk you through a, a few questions that um, that I've uh, worked to try to answer. And, um, and maybe the first one to start with, uh, this work is uh, actually, it's, it's coming out in Siam Review pretty soon, but they seem to take about a year to actually put stuff out. So it's, it's been done for a little while. Um, you can find it on archive. Um, we can think about the following problem. 
how would I, uh, how would I think about assessing the significance of particular structure in a network? And structure, for example, could mean something like groups of nodes that tend to cluster together in the sense that they're tightly interconnected. Um, so I've given a kind of a, a pictorial representation here. And, um, and this is inspired by a, a fellow named Mark Newman, who's a physicist at, in Ann Arbor, uh, who's worked a lot on networks. In the early 2000s, he proposed a heuristic called modularity. And uh, it's kind of a score that he developed that sort of reflects the tendency of, of the nodes within a network to be clustered. So you could kind of imagine, I mean, in my mind, a, a heuristic like this is, is a sort of a test statistic where the test is kind of waiting to be formally defined. And, um, you know, you could imagine that, you know, under a given set of models, the, this test statistic has some distribution if some null is in force. And, you know, perhaps if the test statistic is near zero, that reflects a relatively unstructured network. And if the test statistic is sort of far from zero out in the tails, then that might represent a network that's very, very clustered, like the one that I've shown here. Um, so, uh, so for years and years, people would report the sort of absolute value of modularity in their, in their sort of nature papers and things. And, um, you know, I mean, I guess this would be a little bit like, um, like trying to implement a, uh, an optimal detector without standardizing your, your random variable first, right? So um, it's not really clear. There's no scale on this axis. I mean, how do I understand what the tail is in this distribution? Is a modularity of four large or four to the minus three or four to the plus four? You know, how do I understand the right scale? So um, many sort of pages of effort later, uh, it's clear that there's a fairly generic family of, of, of sort of non-parametric models uh, under which if you scale this test statistic correctly, it will behave like a standard normal in certain limiting regimes. And basically what you need is uh, you need the network uh, to be uh, relatively diffuse and not sort of too sparse. If the network is too sparse, then of course the statistic will kind of converge to zero in probability, and um, and you know you obviously won't have the same the same limiting result. Um, so there's pretty general conditions hold here, and um, and what I've tried to do is give another pictorial example. Uh, if you take an actual data set of self-reported student friendships in high school, um, if you're interested, this is called the adolescent health data set. It's publicly available. It was it was part of an NIH-funded study, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's out there if you're interested in working with it. Um, I've kind of given, again, a sort of pictorial representation. I've imagined kind of clustering the nodes in the network sort of at random, and then clustering them according to the year in school of the high school students. And of course, what you see here is that um, if, the, if, the, if you look at clustering by year in school, you see the same kind of effects that are highlighted up here. So lo and behold, if you evaluate modularity under this clustering, you get a value that's far from the tails. If you evaluate under this clustering, you get a value that's far out of the tails. And with this, you can kind of build all of the classical detection theoretic, decision theoretic frameworks that you would, you would like to, um, you know, thanks to the fact that now you've kind of nailed down a sort of family of limit theorems that are appropriate, you know, for this type of object. And at the same time, you've kind of understood what characteristic of networks will make this theory work and what characteristics will make it fail. So, um, so that's a kind of example, again, of sort of putting some firm theoretical underpinning under a, a technique that was pretty popular but, but was rather heuristic. And when I say pretty popular, I think at last count, the modularity paper had something like 15,000 citations or something, right? So it's a, it's a very widely used method in practice. Um, so another question you could fairly ask is, um, if I observe one large network, large enough network, uh, how much information can I really expect to glean? Or what, what am I entitled to conclude? Um, what information can be obtained from one observation? Um, and an example of a result here uh, could be framed as follows. Suppose I have one of these networks types uh, that tends to exhibit this clustering. Uh, 
Uh, these are known in the literature as sort of block models or part planted partition models. Um, there are a little bit of different descriptive jargon depending on which literature you read. But, but in general, you can frame a theorem as follows. Um, suppose you are looking at a network where the set of nodes divide into, say, k regular groups. And by regular here, I simply mean that you know, the groups need to kind of behave similarly as the network grows. So it's a little bit unfair if you have a network that's divided into 10 groups and nine of the groups remain of constant size and the 10th one goes to infinity as the number of nodes increases or something. So you know, there seems to be some reasonable regularity conditions. Then under what conditions can we recover the group structure if we don't know it in advance? So this is like a, a community detection or a clustering problem. And um, you know, how can I recover the true clusters if I don't know them or some the true labels if I don't know the clusters? Um, and again, a basic theorem under similar conditions to what I showed before is that um, the sort of boundary uh, occurs at root n. So I've got sort of n nodes in the network. Um, I've got essentially n choose two edge variables then. And um, this is the limit of the number of groups that I can recover. As long as k grows sort of no faster than root n, then I can recover groups. So this would be you would write this down as a sort of weak consistency argument about the sort of group variables up to, you know, up to relabeling. Um, so a slightly more, uh, a more general result is to think in some way of this, uh, this clustering problem a little bit more like a, more like a histogram than a clustering. And that probably won't be super obvious from my verbal explanation. But um, another way to think of it is suppose the probability of a particular edge is given by the evaluation of some function f. And suppose I think about approximating f by simple functions. So in other words, think about building a Riemann sum approximation. This is almost what you do when you use a histogram or a kernel density estimator to approximate a density. Um, so it, it turns out that, you know, as the number of nodes in the graph becomes large, the network sort of yields up information on this underlying generative function. These things are known in the literature as graphons or graph limits. And um, what I've tried to do here is I've, I've given a kind of matrix picture and then an underlying function. This comes from the book by Laszlo Lovac that some of you may, may well know on graph limits. And um, you know, kind of recovering this information on f, uh, it tends to be in general a combinatorial problem. So you can write it down, for example, as a sort of maximum likelihood functional approximation problem. And um, I, can, I can create somewhat artificial conditions where where suddenly the solution is, is, is polynomial in complexity. Um, but in general, this is a hard, a computationally hard problem. Um, rates of convergence are possible depending on things like the smoothness class of f. You know, so if, if, if f is holder, this kind of makes sense, right? If f is holder, then, uh, then a, a piecewise constant approximation you know, will, will give you a certain rate of convergence depending on the, the holder exponent of f. And, um, and there are other things you can prove, like oracle inequalities, that come up in the, in the statistics literature. Um, so you can push this idea a little bit farther. And you can say, in general, I don't care whether a network has cluster structure or not. I'm going to use the same idea to approximate and recover the function f. So if a network isn't generated by a clustering model or a community-based model, can I still summarize it in a meaningful way? And the answer is yes. You sort of assume this framework of graph limits. You sort of turn the same algorithmic handle. You implement a, a clustering of nodes according to their connectivity properties. And you use the result to build this kind of Riemann sum approximation I was talking about. Um, and and uh, the fact that we now know how to do this um, resolves a question that, as far as I can tell, was first posed by David Aldous. Uh, a probabilist in 1980s. Uh, he recently retired from Berkeley. He's a National Academies member. And uh, at the Saint-Fleur uh, workshop in 1985, 
he began to do some con to introduce some concepts that involved um, these types of graphs and a, a, a notion of, of probabilistic symmetry called exchangeability that I'm not going to talk about. Um, but it um, it's a kind of a way, again, an analogy to the way that you use a, a, a histogram bending to approximate a smooth function. You can sort of histogram bend the nodes in a network, and you can come up with a, something like a two-dimensional uh, Riemann sum or histogram approximation of the underlying function f. Um, so th this is this stuff is sort of non-obvious. So I wouldn't, you know, necessarily expect anyone to instantly catch it from the slides, but um, but the point, of course, is that any time you can trade a combinatorial object for, for a, a, a functional object, then you know, life gets easier. And in this case, you can bring tools from approximation theory in to kind of bear on what's happening. Um, I, I was telling a few folks today about um, another recent area that we've worked in, uh, that I've worked on, um, which is the general question of how might you compare two networks? I mean, maybe you want to compare two networks to one another. Uh, you've got an experiment that has a, a control group and an experimental group, and each subject yields up a network. So you've got two collections of networks, and you might want to understand whether or not they're drawn from the same distribution. You know, what's, what's the equivalent of a two-sample you know, paired t-test or something like this? Um, or suppose you've got a network and a putative model. How can you understand and assess the goodness of fit of, um, of the observation relative to the model? So, um, so what's kind of interesting here is that the same limit theory uh, gives you some sense that the right thing to do or a right thing to do is to count the occurrence of small subgraphs inside your larger graph. This heuristic has been known for a long time in various areas. So for example, in the social sciences, uh, researchers will often count triangles in a network and this just comes from the idea that, um, that somehow if, uh, if I know Yoram and I know Ali, then Ali and Yoram are more likely than purely uh, owing to chance under independence to know each other uh, because of the fact that you know, we tend to know friends of friends and so on and so forth. Um, but I mean, the question in general would be if I don't know that triangles are significant in my network, um, you know, what subgraphs would I want to count? Um, any, any sort of counts of subgraphs can be turned into features and they can be you know, fed into your favorite you know, wood chipper machine learning algorithm or whatever. But, um, but in what cases can we actually prove something about what we're doing? So it turns out that subgraph counts kind of act an analogy to moments. And, uh, and this is suggestive of a you know, method of moments fitting and testing. But the problem is we lack any sort of ordering. So you know, in the, uh, in the example I've shown here, uh, uh, here I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight vertices, and I've listed in red here all of the graphs that you can form on eight vertices. And you can see already that as the number of vertices increases, the number of graphs scales, you know, essentially, uh, essentially exponentially. Um, so that, that's a problem. You know, what's the appropriate ordering of all these? And then there's the fact that the worst case counting uh, for subgraph occurrences is not known to be better than brute force. So, okay, I can count triangles quickly because I can, I can um, take the product of the adjacency matrix with itself and look at the trace. Um, but if I want to count an arbitrary subgraph on eight vertices, in general, I'm gonna, it's not known whether I can do any better than paying n to the eighth. And obviously, I'm never going to do that. Um, so it's infeasible to count many subgraphs or large subgraphs. But uh, again, if you adopt an appropriate sort of underlying framework, then approximations become possible. So what happens is that it turns out that asymptotically, many of these subgraphs uh, have an order of magnitude lower of probability of occurrence than others. And so you can focus your attention at the end of the day on trees and cycles. So what does that do for us? Well, it allows us to count trees in a network and cycles of various orders as a kind of a way of getting at sort of low order moments of a graph. And um, what I've done here pictorially is I've turned these counts, 
into uh, what are called violin plots. And they're nothing more than kind of kernel density estimates that have been turned on their sides and, and sort of symmetrized. So you could imagine, for example, counting the occurrence of tree-like structures in an erdos renyi random graph, then counting the occurrence of cycles, uh, squares, uh, sorry, you know, triangles, squares, uh, cycles on five nodes, six nodes, seven nodes, etc. So I subsample, I count the number of cycles, I resample, I count the number of cycles, and I average and I build up a distributional approximation of the statistic. Now, if I go through and I artificially close a bunch of triangles in, in a random graph uh, of erdos renyi type, and um, you know, I can rebalance and remove some other edges if I, don't, if I want to keep the number of edges fixed. Um, what you see, of course, immediately is a big boost in, the, in this case, the number of triangles. Um, the other moments, if you like, are relatively unaffected. I mean, they're not orthogonal, but they're relatively unaffected. Um, so this gives me a way to, um, to compare various structures. So uh, another example would be um, a network that comes from the early Barabasi Albert work on scale-free graphs. It's a, it's a metabolic network uh, from C. elegans. And here instead is a power grid network um, drawn from a physical network infrastructure in the southwestern U.S. that appeared in one of the early Watts Strogatz papers on small world models. So how can I sort of quantitatively make the difference between uh, uh, you know, a, um, a preferential attachment graph and a small world model. Well, one thing I can do is I can apply the sort of moment fitting method and I can, you know, sort of see at a glance that the structure is quite different. Um, this type of visual comparison is very, very handy for folks who are working in applied fields or subject domains where they don't really want to know about the underlying methodology but they would like to have something that is sort of visually clear to assess and understand the results of their experiments. But at the same time, underlying this is the notion that if a certain graph limit framework is in force, then it's possible to show that these things will each converge in distribution to Gaussians and, and one can sort of understand the means and variances accordingly. So, so it's also easy to check whether something is asymptotically consistent uh, in a large sample sense with a, with a, given, with a given model. Um, the last two things I'll talk about uh, just before we wrap up are um, uh, how, to how to predict interactions in a network and then in a little bit I'll talk about how to kind of compress a network. So um, these are sort of slight changes of flavor in the sense that I'm not talking at the, about the same sort of asymptotic framework anymore. But, um, but other frameworks will sort of come into play. So um, if you think about um, something like an email network, the set of all emails that are exchanged, you know, for example, amongst the set of people in this room, um, it gets a little more complicated. It's not really a static graph anymore. Um, there, are, uh, there are flows, arguably, from person to person. There are, uh, there are um, there are timings associated with emails, there's content, there is directionality to the email. Um, and one question you might reasonably ask is, um, how could I tell if certain characteristics and behaviors of people in the network are predictive of not or not of interaction? So for example, um, I would suspect that everybody here being an ECE is predictive of a heightened likelihood of exchanging emails relative to people who are in you know, the music department on campus. Probably you would exchange more emails with people in ECE than you would in people in music, and, and so on and so forth. And you could do the same thing for undergraduate students by, by year in school, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and this is actually, that argument is a little bit like the clustering argument I presented earlier. Um, so in this case, you're not going to think about edges in the network as, as Bernoulli variates. You're going to think about a point process uh, whereby messages get emitted between you know, all possible pairs of senders and receivers um, at, at a given time. And the thing that's kind of nice is there's an old trick um, from uh, 
from the earlier uh, study of point processes due to David Cox, and it's called uh, partial likelihood. And the trick is that you model a baseline rate of email sending behavior, or emission behavior, non-parametrically, and you basically quotient it out of the analysis. So you lose the ability to make inference around baseline rates, but you gain the ability to estimate effects. So if you'd like to answer the question of, is there an effect associated with being in the same academic department, then suddenly you can estimate that effect, and if it's sufficiently close to zero, um, you know, you have no conclusion, and if it's sufficiently far from zero and you believe the model is true, then you'll conclude that there's an effect. Um, and the interesting thing is that um, in a situation like this, you're even allowed to kind of regress on past sending behavior. So the single biggest effect when you look at a real email network is, um, is usually sort of time since last email exchanged. And, you know, we all know this to be true. You might not email somebody from a while and then suddenly you'll have a kind of burst of email activity with them. Um, and that effect is not very interesting because it's sort of universal. I mean, we're all sort of subject to it. It's part of how we use email. If you want to actually draw interesting conclusions about the people in the email network, you've got to model that effect and knock it out. And so that's something you can do. Um, so here, the asymptotics are slightly different. You can look at a, a fixed uh, graph or a fixed set of people and you can let time go to infinity and then you get the sort of asymptotics that come from the, the point process running for a long time. Or you can look jointly as the network is allowed to expand over time and, and also time runs to infinity. Um, and essentially, in either case, you're going to get a large number of email exchanges and that's the sort of quantity that kind of governs the asymptotics. And again, if, um, if you do it right, if you're in the right asymptotic regime, then things become, uh, become jointly Gaussian in the end and, um, and you can use standard sort of convex methods to, um, to fit a sort of maximum partial likelihood model. And, um, you know, it scales with the number of emails or something because how could you not touch every piece of data? Um, but uh, but it's, it's, it's sort of reasonably implementable for, for medium-sized problems at least, I would say. Um, so, uh, so this is just a, a chart that kind of references what I said before, that um, if you look at an actual email network, the easy publicly available one is from the Enron Corporation because it failed in a massive accounting scandal and all the emails of the top people were made public as part of the investigation. Um, what you'll see is that um, the, the, the kind of boost, the multiplicative boost that you get, read as e to a certain power, um, comes largely from uh, Having, uh, having sent or received an email with somebody, you know, exchanged an email with somebody in the recent past. So the effects all start out large if an email was sent or received in the past 30 minutes, and then they kind of taper off to a baseline effect of e to the zero, which is one, uh, as, as time goes to infinity. So the, the conclusions themselves aren't very interesting for this data set. But, um, but the kind of point is that you can, you know, you can sort of see these effects and begin to capture them. And, um, and that gets you closer to actually drawing, you know, inferences from the, from the data, uh, despite the fact that it has this interesting network structure. It's certainly not IID, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so last thing I said I'd talk about, this is actually a kind of a old wine and new bottles or something. Um, it's a, a network version of a, of a problem that's been known in machine learning for a long time. And, um, and uh, actually this was, I mention it in large part because it was one of the first problems that Ali and I worked on together. Um, so uh, you could think of this problem as the following. Um, suppose that you're allowed to only store part of a network. So you get to keep k out of n network nodes and you get to keep the corresponding links. So in the, in the networks literature and the social sciences, this is called egocentric sampling. Like you, you kind of take one individual and then you, you know, survey all their friends or something like this. Um, so you can ask the natural questions, well, what's the optimal set of nodes to preserve if I have access to the entire network? And how well can this best set represent the entire, the entire structure? Um, 
And the interesting thing here is that randomized algorithms in this setting do well if you, um, if you choose the subset in a nice way, um, which I'll talk about in a second, um, you get uh, uh, an error rate that, um, that looks and feels very much like that of having done a singular value decomposition. So if I, if I do a singular value decomposition of a, of a network adjacency structure and I keep the top k eigenvector eigenvalue pairs, I know that I have the best possible rank k approximation possible in the sense of any unitarily invariant matrix norm, right? So that's the best I can do. I sort of rotate the matrix into position and then I, I cut. Um, but what, one way to think about this question is I'm not allowed to rotate the matrix in any sense. I have to stick with the observed basis, the being the rows and columns of the adjacency structure. So which rows and columns should I keep? That's the kind of egocentric sampling question. So what I can do is I can look at the graph Laplacian, which is a quadratic form associated with the graph, and I can, um, I can, uh, I can calculate, in theory, every principal submatrix uh, corresponding to a given subset of rows and columns. And, um, and uh, these uh, principal submatrices will have non-negative determinant. This distribu induces a probability distribution uh, on these subsets. And um, if I now sample according to this probability distribution, um, then I get an op optimal rate approximation with a small constant. And uh, we didn't know it at the time, but uh, some folks later in theoretical computer science showed that um, algorithms of these type, which are, this is technically, if you, you can't sort of implement this directly unless you're willing to enumerate combinatorially many uh, subsets. But if you simulate this with a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, a basic metropolis kernel, um, then it turns out that in certain cases these chains are fast mixing. So the, the kind of um, the computational burden has been displaced onto the choice of subset, but it's now known that the choice of subset, the, the computation associated with choosing the subset can be, can be fast. Um, and in and, and machine learning, people call this the sort of landmark selection problem. If you have uh, a billion images and you build a kernel matrix uh, of, uh, of a billion by a billion rows and columns, um, and you'd like to keep, you'd like to kind of compress that to a 10,000 by 10,000, you know, then how do you do it? And uh, of course, you could randomly, uniformly choose 10,000 out of a million examples or you could do something that's slightly smarter and data dependent. Of course, you pay more uh, in computationally, but of course, you get a better bound on how well you've approximated the original structure. So, you know, one more version of there being not so much uh, of a free lunch. Uh, okay, so, uh, so that's it. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of gonna uh, get ready to stop here and then take questions if anyone has, has them, but, um, in general, I guess, I think <coughs> if, uh, if there's a set of common themes to be, to be taken away from this, I think it's, um, you know, as the subject of network analysis matures, you know, we're, we're kind of building fundamental mathematical understanding. And as that understanding grows, we should see, you know, algorithms with provable properties, you know, tools and methodologies and techniques kind of coming. Uh, these models always have the challenge of, you know, how do we balance complexity with parsimony? How do we take a given amount of modeling degrees of freedom and use them in a, in a judicious way? And, um, and then again, how do we sort of prove when the algorithms should work and when they, when they might fail? Um, eventually, whether you kind of care about networks as a type of data or not, um, it's reasonable, I think, to expect that, um, there should be inferential tools and procedures that allow you to sort of make sense of networks as data sets. And, uh, and that's really what I've been um, spending my time working on for, uh, for some time now. So I'll stop there and uh, thank you very much. It's great to be back and to be here and uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Patrick. Are there any questions for Dr. Wolf?
please. Okay, I have uh, some technical questions that I may keep for later, but first, a, perhaps a broader question. So in all the examples, you mentioned the networks where networks are static agents. Yeah. And I guess, so you have a broad over overview of the fields. How do you think uh, you can connect this with networks where all the agents now are dynamical systems? Do you see a lot of interaction between what control theories do where we can have network control, where we have similar networks, but each dot there is a dynamical system, and what is done in the statistics literature, or are these two fields still, yeah. in your opinion, pretty much distinct? I think it's fairly distinct at the moment. I think um, there, um, there isn't a lot of intersection between people who study graphs as relatively static objects and then people who have a deeper understanding of kind of differential equations and flows over network structures. Um, even what I talked about near the end was almost a little bit of a halfway house where we're using some point process framework. I mean, that's kind of continuous time, but not continuous in the, in the sense that you would think of defining honest to goodness flows across a structure. So, um, I mean, my understanding of network control is relatively limited but I have begun uh, to see people apply it in the study of biological networks. Um, it's not really clear to me, I think, whether the technical connections are really um, firmly enough established mm -hmm. for people to be able to draw meaningful conclusions in those, in those contexts. Yeah. But as, in terms of communities, I think it's pretty, it's pretty disparate. The, the, the statistics community that's really jumped on to these types of problems tend to be people who are um, interested in doing sort of highly technical work and non-parametrics, and this gives a new area to apply their techniques. So it's, it's kind of a little bit like people bringing their bag of techniques to this set of problems. And I think there aren't that many people who have the requisite knowledge and control to kind of cross over. I see. Yeah. What else? Are there any questions? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we'll ask yeah. perhaps one more question. So you also mentioned graphons, uh, yeah. so these graph limits. And the last time we spoke about it, actually, I think, was in the program we mentioned in Cambridge. And one of the big problems at that time was to find an appropriate scaling, an appropriate limit to describe sparser graphs. Yeah. So they tend to be, or they are, actually very dense. I was just wondering if you were keeping up uh, with this research, and can we now, do we now have a functional description of sparse graphs in the limit where n goes to infinity? So we, we do. Um, I wouldn't say that it's wholly satisfactory, but um, the example that I gave, if you remember, I, I painted a picture or, or took a picture of, um, of this notion of a representation of a, of a graph limit as a, a, a symmetric non-negative function that lives, you know, for example, on the unit square. Um, there are many other ways to think about it, but, but that way will do. Um, and uh, if we forget about the most of the technical details for the moment, what's kind of important here is for this equation to be meaningful. Um, I mean, forget about measurability and all, all the other nonsense. For this equation to be meaningful at a very basic level, you know, f really needs to be bounded. And then one simply rescales f to be between 0 and 1, and, and then the identification with probabilities is kind of instantaneous. So it turns out, and in some sense this is intuitive, but making it technically precise is challenging, that, um, that considering unbounded classes of f, you know, bits of, you know, f with bits that escape to infinity, um, and then rescaling the whole thing allows you to produce a sequence of such f's and uh, the right use of that sequence will allow you to start to model sparser graphs. I wouldn't necessarily say that the sparse graphs that you can achieve in that way are realistically related to real networks, but they do give you a way of, um, of kind of uh, doing a correct version of a, of a sparse graph limit. It's a little bit ugly, I guess you could say, or it's, it's not quite as elegant and self-contained as the dense case. But, um, but it is possible to do it technically correctly. If you're interested, the, um, the papers are called uh, LP graphons, you know, the idea that this would be an L infinity graphon, and, uh, and thereby uh, 
Jennifer Chase, uh, Christian Borgs, and, and co-authors. So there's a few long technical archive papers, preprints about this. Does that answer your question? Yes. Yeah. Completely, thank you. Great. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank Dr. Wolf again. Thank you. Thank you.